Hello, MDS, and let's get it rolling with Offensive Player of the Week. As always, MDS, you're up first. Well, I'm going with Lamar Jackson, who had the 11th double-triple of his NFL career. That's 239 passing yards and 107 rushing yards. He's already got 11 double-triples. No one else in NFL history even has 10. But, you know, I think more than just the statistics, Lamar Jackson, he said before the game, it's not about him and Patrick Mahomes. But I think to a, a significant extent, it is because we judge the great quarterbacks by how they compare to their contemporaries. And if Lamar Jackson wants to be part of the next generation of great quarterbacks, he has to be able to lead his team to wins over Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. And on Sunday night, he did just that. MDS, what a difference a week makes for Lamar Jackson and for Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry, week one, 17 carries for 58 yards, no touchdowns. The Titans get blown out. What happens in week two? He comes back, 35 carries, 182 yards, three touchdowns, and the Titans win 33-30. It's amazing when the Titans put the ball in Derrick Henry's hands. What happens? Good things happen. He now leads the league once again. He's going to probably be three straight, barring in injury but he now leads the league 52 carries 240 yards and three touchdowns his 61 touches also lead the league Mike and Derrick Henry looks like Derrick Henry again took a little while but he finally got it going and the Titans get to one and one with that big overtime win I'm going with the guy that we already talked about Aaron Jones four touchdowns last night three receiving touchdowns for the Green Bay Packers he was a guy that could have become a free agent back in March the pack uh, the Packers kept him around I don't know if he could have gotten more anywhere else probably not as I said last segment typically what happens is running backs get their best deals with the teams they've already played for but Jones played extremely well an important weapon in that Packers offense and a, 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 a sad story this year dedicating the season to his late father all right let's pivot over to the other side of the ball defensive player of the week for week two mds who do you have i have roquan smith of the bears who really had an outstanding game against the bengals he had a pick six he had a sack he had five solo tackles i think he may now have surpassed khalil mack as the most important player on that bears defense and if andy dalton's injury means they're going to justin fields I think the best thing the Bears can do for Fields is to put him in a position where he doesn't need to do too much and a good defense led by Roquan Smith may prove to be the best way not to put too much on Justin Fields, but to tell Justin Fields, just play within yourself. You don't have to do everything. Just don't turn the ball over. Don't make any big mistakes and our defense will take care of the rest. Shutouts are really hard to get in the NFL. The Bills were able to get one on Sunday. There were a host of Bills you could have picked off of that defense. I went with Matt Milano. He had five tackles, a sack, two quarterbacks hits, two tackles for loss, a fumble recovery. He was all over the place. I thought he played outstanding for the Bills and a big reason that they were able to shut out the Miami Dolphins. I'm going with Mike Edwards, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defensive back, who had a couple of interceptions that were returned for touchdowns. It reminded me of Super Bowl 37 when Dwight Smith had two interception returns for touchdowns. One of them came so late that he wasn't the MVP. He should have been the MVP. The voting was closed. Dexter (laughs) Jackson got it. It should have been Dwight Smith. But Mike Edwards, the defensive MVP of that game against the Atlanta Falcons, providing 14 points single-handedly in the Tampa Bay defensive effort. Let's go now to the Rookie of the Week. MDS, who do you have? You know, Mac Jones of the Patriots has not been spectacular, but he's doing what his fellow rookie quarterbacks are not doing, and that's avoiding big mistakes. Through two games, Jones doesn't have a single turnover, and I really think that's what Bill Belichick wants from him. He wants him to play smart, play safe. That's what Mac Jones is doing so far. I think he is playing within the system that the Patriots are asking of him. And I think that in that context, he's playing very well. Write down Micah Parsons' name for Defensive Rookie of the Year because he's on his way to doing that. You know, the Cowboys lost both of their starting defensive ends after week one. Randy Gregory went on the COVID list and Demarcus Lawrence broke that foot, going to be out a while. 
So they asked my, uh, Micah Parsons to be a pass rusher, and he did it, and he did it very well. He had two tackles, a sack, and four hurries, and his sack came at the perfect time. It was for 18 yards with the Chargers having a second goal at the seven with five minutes left, and instead of getting a touchdown, having a chance there, Chargers had to kick the field goal, and we know what happened after that. The Cowboys went down and kicked the game-winning field goal, but Micah Parsons set that up. He was all over the place, as he was in week one as well. What a horrible call that was, too, of forward progress stopped. Yeah. It saved the, the Seahawks from a walk-off safety, but it also cost the Chargers a huge opportunity to score a touchdown instead of a field goal late in the game. I'm going with a guy that pairs up with my favorite quarterback to watch in the NFL, and he's actually shorter than Kyler Murray. That's Rondell Moore. He had seven catches for 114 yards and a touchdown, a 77-yarder. And maybe it's because he's so little they didn't notice him, but he was so wide open on that touchdown against the Vikings that he was able to stand there and wait for the ball. He just kind of parked and waited like a like a left fielder catching a can of corn. Those are likely to be dropped, too, when you're that wide open. But Rondell Moore, an exciting player for the Cardinals. And every time it's Murray to Moore, as PFT commenter pointed out, it looks like Murray is throwing to Murray because they look like the same guy. They're about the same size. But, again, Moore a little bit smaller. Coach of the Week, final award for Week 2. MDS, who you got? I got Panthers coach Matt Rule, who has this team playing better than I was expecting. Sunday's 26-7 to win over the Saints, I think, was better than just about anyone expected. But, you know, this team looks further along in year two with Matt Rule than I, I really saw coming. I think that Sam Darnold looks like he's being well coached now, and that's not just on Matt Rule. That's the entire coaching staff. But, you know, there were a lot of questions when he was struggling with the Jets. Is it him or is it just that the Jets are a bad situation for him to be in? The Panthers, Carolina now looks like a good situation for him to be in. I think Matt Rule has put together a good coaching staff. He's got a lot of young players buying into his system. I like what Matt Rule is doing with the Panthers. John Harbaugh had the most aggressive move of the week two, and it paid off for him. He trusted his quarterback, Lamar uh, Jackson to get it done you know they got the ball back on that fumble recovery with 120 left at the Baltimore 34 Lamar Jackson ran it four times and that was a big decision on fourth down but we all expect that if they had punted that ball away that Patrick Mahomes was going to lead the Chiefs back to victory so they let it didn't let it get to that fourth and one John Harbaugh asked Lamar Jackson Lamar do you want to go for it and he knew what the answer was going to be. Everybody knew what the answer was going to be, and it paid off. Lamar Jackson picks up the first down, and the next one they get into victory formation, and it's done. They never gave the ball back to Patrick Mahomes. Smart move by John Harbaugh, but it also was a gutsy call. What also made that, that fourth down call so jarring, the drive began as if they were deliberately going to play it safe and not screw it up and not give Kansas City a short field, just force them to use their timeouts. And then all of a sudden, they gain seven or eight yards on third down. They're in position for fourth and short, and there it is. We're going for it, and uh, it worked and smart. The, the only thing I need to know about the analytics on that play is if Patrick Mahomes gets the ball back, the Ravens are going to lose the game. My coach of the week, I'll go back to that Buffalo game. It was so impressive to get the shutout, 35 nothing. Leslie Frazier, defensive coordinator of the Bills, who never gets the credit he deserves and should, I think, at some point, be a serious candidate to be a head coach again. He he spent some time as the Vikings head coach. They had a mixed bag of results. He took the team to the playoffs in 2012, but he's done great things with the Buffalo defense. And not that they went into the game intending to try to injure Tua Tonga by Loa, but it's fair game to go after the quarterback. It's fair game to hit the quarterback legally. And if the quarterback can't continue, again, we, we feel differently about that than we did pre-Bounty Gate, but that's been a fundamental premise in football for years. Through the application of clean legal hits, if your opponent cannot continue, you're more likely to win the game. And that made it much more likely the Bills were going to win that game, get to 1-1, one and one, and try to keep building going forward an offense like the one they had last year. But if their defense plays like last year, they will be in great position. We say farewell to MDS. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.